the first order of the evening is invocations and prayers. Student Ayman Jibril Swedan will recite verses from the Holy Quran and student Sahista Kasamali, she will read the translation of the recited verses. These are the students from BC Muslim Association Secondary School, Richmond. I request them to come on the podium. <laughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. <coughs> All the praises and thanks be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the most beneficent, the most merciful, the only master of the day of judgment. You alone we worship, and you alone we ask for help. Guide us to the straight way, the way of those on whom you have bestowed your grace, not the way of those who earn your anger and those who went astray. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وليحكم أهل الإنجيل بما أنزل الله فيه ومن لم يحكم بما أنزل الله فأولئك هم الفاسقون Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed Therein, and whosoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then such people are disobedient to Allah. Surah Ma'idah, Ayah 47. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا تجادل أهل الكتاب إلا بالتي هي أحسن إلا الذين ظلموا منهم. وَقُولُوا آمَنَّا بِالَّذِي أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا وَأُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ وَإِلَهُنَا وَإِلَهُكُمْ وَاحِدٌ وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ صدق الله العظيم And do not dispute with the people of the book unless it be in a way that is the best except with such of them who do wrong and say to them, We believe in that which has been revealed to us and revealed to you. Our God and your God is one, and to him we have submitted as believers. Surah Ankabut, Ayah 46. Thank you. I request Reverend Lee Stone King to recite prayers from the Holy Bible. Please remain seated and observe silence. Lord Jesus, tonight, by the power of your wonderful spirit, by the glory and the power of truth. We come to this place in the matchless name of Jesus. It is written in your word, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Let truth make us free here tonight. Cause honest dialogue to change the way we think and the way we feel and the way we believe. For there is one God and only one. His name is Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end. Tonight, wrap your arms of love and mercy around us. Let the spirit of revelation and the spirit of understanding grip us. Help us to reach out one to another and help the love of God and the power of God and the majesty of your being and spirit embrace us. We shall not fail to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. We ask these things in the matchless, resplendent, all-powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now the guidelines. Our subject today is to define the personality, the nature, 
of Jesus Christ. It is not what is Christianity or not what is Islam. So I may remind the speakers, this is our subject today. Secondly, any speaker can quote from any scripture, be it Quran or Bible. No mudslinging. I don't have to tell them. They have attended such functions many, many times over and over again. Remember, one thing, names Jesus Christ and Virgin Mary. They are taken with great reverence and respect, believe me, both by Muslims and Christians. Let us solidify such commonalities. They were, have got us together on one platform this evening. The Bible and Quran both say, the righteous shall inherit the earth. In other words, those who are on the path of God's truth, on the right path, they shall keep growing and multiplying. And in the end, they shall inherit. And those who are on the path of errors and fallacy, they will keep plummeting and dwindling. God does not fail in keeping his promise. Finally, I thank you all. God bless you for listening me peacefully. Dr. Jamal Badawi, please. <coughs> الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على محمد خاتم رسول الله وعلى سائر أنبياء الله. All praise is due to Allah, the sole Creator, Sustainer, and Cherisher of the universe, and may His peace and blessing be upon His last and final messenger, Muhammad, and upon all prophets and messengers who preceded him. I greet you all with the Islamic greeting, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته, which means may the peace, mercy, and blessing of Allah be with you all. And thank you all for the opportunity and the honor to share with you a few humble thoughts on the topic of tonight. And since the presentation tonight is about Jesus, peace be upon him, from an Islamic perspective, it might be useful to take just a few seconds to define the term Islam. Based on its uh, etymology, the word Islam actually means to achieve peace through submission to and obedience to God in English, Dieu in French, Allah in Arabic, Allah in Aramaic, in the Aramaic Bible, Allah. Who is the one and same universal God and Lord of all? Peace here refers to peace with Allah, inner peace, and peace with others, humans, animals, ecology, and the universe at large. Defined as such, Islam was the faith, religion, and message of all of the prophets of Allah, the greatest five of whom are Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. May God's peace and blessing be with them all. It is within this framework or reference that we can say that Jesus is no stranger to Muslims, no stranger to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who said that he is the closest or nearest in love to Jesus, son of Mary, in this life and in the life to come. Muslims base their belief about Jesus on the Quran and Hadith. Hadith means the saying of the Prophet. Due to time limits, this presentation focuses on the Quran, which to the Muslims is the word of Allah, God revealed to his final and universal messenger, Muhammad, peace be upon him. The praises of Jesus in the Quran begins with his family, particularly his mother, Mary, after whose name one surah in the Quran, surah 19, is named. While in seclusion, Virgin Mary, the chaste woman, was confronted by Archangel Gabriel, who appeared before her in a human form, giving her the news of Allah's decision to create a child in her womb 
in a miraculous way. In response to her shock and amazement, the angel says, quote, so it will be, for Allah creates what he wills. When he has decreed something, he only says to it, be, and it is. When it was time to give birth to the baby, Mary became more worried about her people's reaction, which proved to be humiliating and embarrassing. Mary pointed to Jesus, the baby, in her arms. And he spoke on behalf of his mother and summed up his nature and his mission. Said he, I am a servant of Allah. He has given me the scriptures and made me a prophet. And he had made me blessed wheresoever I be. And he has enjoined on me prayers and charity as long as I live. As Jesus grew up and began his ministry, he continued to teach what all prophets taught before him and what the last prophet Muhammad taught after him, the pure, unblemished monotheistic faith, the religion of all of the prophets. One of his clear statements quoted in the Quran, verily Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so worship him alone. That is the straight path. Like several prophets, Allah supported him with signs or miracles, which Jesus consistently proclaimed to be possible only by the leave of Allah. <coughs> In spite of all such signs and miracles, most rejected him. Some even plotted to kill him. Yet, Allah thwarted such a plot and raised Jesus up unto himself. While no details are given in the Quran, the expression, Shubbiha lahum, but it so appeared to them, may imply that someone indeed was crucified, that people believed that that person was Jesus, but in fact, it was not him. Prior to the uplifting of Jesus from the gates of death, he gave good news, Bushra, good news, of the future advent of his successor prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, as we see in Surah 61. In doing so, Jesus was echoing earlier prophecies about a great messenger of God to come from the progeny of Abraham through his first son, Ishmael, and as such, the blessing of all nations through Abraham would be fulfilled. A review of the profile of Jesus in the Quran leads us to conclude that the main difference between Muslims and their Christian brethren is not related to the acceptance of, respect of, love and honor of Jesus, peace be upon him. To the Muslim, this is simply an article of faith. The real difference relates to the nature of Jesus, which Muslims firmly uphold to be only a human. Several passages in the Quran make this point quite clear. And for those who are familiar with the Arabic language, they can even appreciate it more. In huwa illa abdun. In huwa illa abdun. He is no more. He is only a servant of God. Mal Masih ibn Maryam illa rasul. Jesus, the son of Mary, was only, no more than a messenger. Inna mal Masih Isa ibn Maryam rasulullah. Indeed, Jesus, the son of Mary, was the messenger of Allah. All such expressions exclude any other designation implying any divine nature whatsoever. In fact, none of the divine attributes 
of Allah, God, apply to any person, Jesus, Muhammad, Abraham, or any other creature of God. They include the following. First, nothing is like unto God or comparable unto God. Any person who is a human, he looks like other humans, he cannot be God. Secondly, only Allah is uncreated, self-subsisting, and life-giver. It is Allah who gave life to Jesus. It is Allah who created Jesus in the womb of his mother. Thirdly, only Allah has complete and original knowledge of the unseen. Alim al wa shahada And we all know that in the Bible, Jesus denied knowing the hour or the unseen. Fourthly, only Allah is ever living, never dies, never get weary, never is overcome by slumber or sleep. These are characteristics of all humans, all prophets, Jesus, peace be upon him, included. Fifthly, Allah is the one who feeds us, but he is never fed by anyone. Jesus ate food. He was fed by his mother from the breast of his mother. He is a human being, nothing but. Sixthly, only Allah is the one who fashions us in the wombs of our mothers. As the Quran says, whether fashions us through the known process of procreation or fashioning us in a miraculous way as he did to Jesus or creating from neither male or female like the creation of Adam in all cases Allah alone is the creator all others are his creatures while the Quran is clear on the issue of the exclusive humanity of Jesus peace be upon him it gives him a number of honorific titles, including Nabi, Prophet, Rasul, Messenger. Messiah literally means anointed or rubbed one. Ayah, a sign of Allah's power. By the way, this is the title which is shared also by his mother. His mother also is Ayah. Anything that shows the power of Allah, whether Jesus or others, is regarded in the Quranic terminology, a sign of the power of Allah. He is described as one who was an example for the Israelite, one who is honored in this life and the life to come, and one among those who are nearest to Allah. He is described as mercy from Allah, similar to the title given to Prophet Muhammad, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as mercy to the worlds. He is described as a servant of Allah. He is described as a word from Allah, not the word, a word from Allah, meaning created by the command of Allah, be. As the Quran says, whenever Allah decides on any matter, he only says to it, be, and it is. The word is used in the Quran in a meaning that is totally different from the Greek logos. In the Quran actually uses the term in plural, kalimat, not just a word or the word, kalimat in plural. He is described in the Quran as a spirit from Allah, i.e. deriving his life and existence and the knowledge of God from God. The same expression that the Quran used to refer to Adam also, to every human being in the famous expression, nafakha fihim ruhi that Allah breathed into every human something of his spirit. He is described in the Quran as a pure child, similar to the title given also to John the Baptist, even in the exaggerated form, Zakatan, in the very same surah where Jesus is described as a pure child. And we have to remember that Muslims believe that every child is born innocent and pure. Finally, it is a common mistake to say that the Quran only negates what mainstream Christianity considered to be heretical, such as tritheism or other forms, that is not true. 
there are clear expressions in the Quran negating any form of deification whatsoever, whether what was regarded as heretical or mainstream. That leads us to conclude that Jesus, peace be upon him, was a great prophet and messenger of Allah. Nothing less, but nothing more. And I end with a quotation from the Quran. ذلك عيسى ابن مريم قول الحق الذي فيه يمترون or قول الحق there are two recitations for that such is Jesus son of Mary it is a statement of truth about which they dispute thank you thank you Dr. Jamal Badawi While I was listening to the doctor, I saw there was so much peace in the hall as if the peace of God had come down, the tranquility. And I have never seen such audience. So I thank you. Please maintain this peace till the end of the program, even in the questions and answers. <coughs> Inshallah, God willing. Okay, now our next speaker is Dr. David K. Bernard. Thank you very much. I believe a dialogue such as this is very important for us to have an accurate understanding of the beliefs that we have. And I do think there is much common ground from which to progress because we very firmly hold the monotheistic faith, and that is vitally important. We do hold the importance of moral living and modesty on the inside, modesty on the outside, in stark contrast to our society around us. And I would like to say at the outset, I'm not here to promote Christianity as an organization or as a tradition, because I stand opposed to much of the distortion of Christianity through the centuries. For example, the idea of three personalities in the Godhead, I do not find to be a part of the scriptures. So what I'm going to try to do is go to the Bible itself to see what it says about Jesus Christ. I do want to emphasize that monotheism, the belief in one God, is absolutely essential to understanding this subject. As Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I will quote a number of scriptures, but because time is so limited, I will have to say them quite rapidly. And uh, maybe you can get the video or the tape to follow up and look these up yourselves. But Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And that is foundational to the faith of the scriptures. Jesus Christ himself, when asked which is the greatest commandment of all, responded in the gospel of Mark chapter 12 with these very words. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. If you read through the Bible, for example, uh, the book of Isaiah, I will just make a few references. It very firmly says, Isaiah chapter 43, uh, for instance, verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord. Beside me there is no Savior. Verse 10, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Isaiah 44, 6, I am the first, I am the last, beside me there is no God. Verse 8, is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God, I know not any. Verse uh, Chapter uh, 44, verse 24, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, He that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Isaiah 45, 22, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. I think probably we can all agree on these statements of Scripture, that there is absolutely one God, and only one God. We understand the Bible teaches very clearly that God is our Father, that God has revealed himself as the Word, and that God has revealed himself as the Holy Spirit. These designations do not refer to different personalities, but rather to the one true God. 
in parental relationship to the human race, he is our father. As revealing his mind, his thought, his plan, as God revealing himself, he is the word. As God moving in spiritual action in our lives, he is the Holy Spirit. But these designations do not create a multiplicity of gods. They create one God who is known to us and revealed to us in various ways. The Bible also speaks, particularly in the New Testament, although it's prophesied in the Old Testament, that there would come one who is known as the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God or the unique Son of God. And that simply refers to God as manifested in the flesh. The Son of God is the human embodiment, the human personification of the one God. Perhaps this is a difficult concept for some to understand. They would think God cannot do such a thing. But all things are possible with God. We should be very cautious in asserting that God cannot do a certain thing. I noted that Islam teaches that Jesus is a spirit who was made flesh. I would simply say Jesus is the spirit who was made flesh. If we as finite, simple human beings can be spirit beings embodied with human personification, we should not say that the infinite God of the universe cannot do what we are ourselves. What I'm saying is the God of the universe can come in the flesh and reveal himself as such, and yet his spirit be unlimited. And so we believe that the Son of God is actually God manifested in the flesh. We cannot confine the invisible, uh, omnipresent, or all-present spirit of God to one body. But we can say that the character and personality of God was fully revealed in the human person of Jesus Christ. For example, the Christians with the Bible, the Muslims with the Quran, believe that this book is the Word of God, pure, untainted by sin or error, yet it was written by fallible human beings. If the invisible, pure Word of God can be revealed in finite human terms, yet without error or taint, then can we not also say that the invisible, pure, and perfect God could reveal himself in human flesh, yet without sin or taint of fallen humanity? All things are possible with God. Of course, to resolve this issue, we must see exactly what does the Word of God say. And I will go to the Bible, since, as you've already learned, both Muslims and Christians believe that the Bible is indeed the Word of God. In Luke chapter 1, verse 35, the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and said that she would have a child, even though she was a virgin. The Holy Spirit of God would overshadow her, perform a miracle in her womb, and therefore the Holy One, which would be born of her, would be called the Son of God. Notice this term is not an eternal son, a second person of deity, but because the Spirit of God fathered this baby by an invisible miracle, he would be called literally the Son of God. Not the son of Joseph or any other man, but the son of Mary, inheriting his humanity from Mary, and the Son of God, inheriting the divine nature, the Spirit manifested in the flesh as the Son of God. Therefore, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Colossae, said in Colossians 2, 9, speaking of Jesus Christ, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Godhead refers to the personality and character of God, the sum total of his identity and attributes. I think we can all agree that God cannot be divided. He cannot be minimized. There can be no such thing as a junior God or a demigod or a piece of God or a portion of God. Wherever God is revealed, he must be revealed in his totality. Even though we humans may not be able to comprehend that totality, I think we must all agree on the indivisible nature and perfection of God. And so when the Bible says clearly that Jesus was the Godhead bodily, that excludes any possibility that he was a man only, a junior God, a demigod, a being like unto God, but it means that he is the Godhead personified. 
Lest there be any mistake, the scripture says, the fullness of the Godhead. Strictly speaking, fullness here is redundant because the Godhead is full, complete, perfect, undivided. But lest there be any misunderstanding, the scripture says, the fullness of the Godhead. And yet, a little bit further, it says, all the fullness. Fullness by its very meaning encompasses all. But so there would be no debate and no dispute on the very issue that we're discussing tonight. The Bible says in unequivocal terms, if you will accept its authority, in Jesus Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the human personification of the infinite God. This is the consistent message of the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures as well as the Greek. Isaiah 7, 14, uh, the virgin will conceive... And bear a child, bear a son, his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew 1, that being would be called Jesus, whose name literally means Jehovah Savior. Jehovah has become our salvation. Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, that Jews, Muslims, and Christians all claim to be the one God, has become our Savior in the person of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us a child is born, a son is given. But he's not just a child, not just a son. I would agree Jesus is a man, but I would not agree that he's only a man. Because that child and son is more than a child and son, according to Scripture. He is also called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, when Jesus was born in the Gospels, you see first and foremost his humanity because that is how people confronted him. They saw him as a man. They could not see the invisible spirit beneath the outer human flesh. And so a gradual uh, awareness dawned on them across the years. But as they saw him create food for 5,000, as they saw him calm the storm by his own word, as they saw him walk on water, they realized he had power over creation itself. Who has that power but God alone? They saw him raise the dead. They saw him heal the sick by his own word, not by calling on the name of someone else. They saw him cast out demons by his own authority. They saw him forgive sin and say that the Son of Man, referring to himself, has power to forgive sin. They saw him say, I will raise my own body from death in three days. And then he fulfilled it. And so gradually they begin to understand we're dealing with more than just a man. In John 14, Jesus said, I'm going to bring you to the Father. Philip said, if you will just show us the Father one time, we will be satisfied. If Jesus was not the revelation of the true God, he should have said, well, I will show him to you in a vision, or when you get to heaven, you will see him, or I'm sorry, but no one could ever see him. He did not answer in that way. He said, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. How can you ask such a question? In other words, God is an invisible spirit. The only way to see God is through some physical manifestation. He said, if you cannot believe the words, believe the works that I do. I've done things that only God could do. And if you would contemplate these divine works, you would see that the Father who dwelleth in me, he does the works. In John chapter 20, the climax of the Gospel of John, the resurrected Christ appeared to his disciples. One was absent. He did not believe. Jesus appeared a second time. This time that disciple Thomas was there. And Jesus said, go ahead and touch me. You can see the nail prints in my hands. You know I was truly crucified. And Thomas simply said, my Lord and my God. Here was a Jew trained from his mother's womb. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. When he said, my God, that was a revelation to him that this one who stood before him was more than a visible man. But the invisible spirit of the one God was fully displayed. At this point, if Jesus were not who Thomas worshipped him as and confessed him to be, Jesus should have denounced him, denied it, and said, no, do not worship me, only worship God. Instead, Jesus said, you are blessed, Thomas, because you see and believe. But also blessed will be...
The Apostle Paul had a dramatic conversion experience in Acts chapter 9. The light of God shone from heaven and struck him down as he thought he was doing the work and will of God. He realized that all of his concepts were mistaken, so he went back to the first question, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord, this was a Jew speaking, the one God, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That was the concept in his mind. And God answered from heaven, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And that's why Christians today, in the words of Titus 2.13, are looking for the appearance of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why I quoted from Isaiah, God said unto me, every knee will bow, every tongue will swear, confess. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, we find at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We believe Jesus was and is a man, but we believe he is more than just a man. We believe he is, not merely was, but he is today God manifested in the flesh to take away our sin. Only as a man could he atone for our sins by death, but only as God does he have power to forgive us our sins. Dr. David 